We're going to start today <laughs> with a vision of how things are meant to be. Psalm 104 is a celebration of God and his creation. It's kind of like a nature documentary, uh, but with a slightly different commentary to Sir David Attenborough's. And I'm going to read it. Uh, the words aren't going to come up on the screen. Instead, we're going to have some images uh, that uh, accompany uh, the words, and uh, we're going to try and have some music as well. Uh, so, Johnny, if you want to get that rolling for us, that would be great. It's one of those bits of music that starts very quietly, so we're all going to guess that it started. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot, he rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the places that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They, sit and they sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted, in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it's night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here's the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, things living both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open their, your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they're dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I'll sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. 
Let sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. This is God's word. And this is God's word about his world. It is a glimpse of creation as it should be and as it one day will be again. And as it isn't quite right now. Which is why COP26 is starting in Glasgow today and why we thought it would be a good moment to look at what the Bible has to say about creation and climate change. It's a jarring a combination of paradoxes and complications to move from that to then think about plastic and emissions. Nothing is straightforward with this. There are uh, answers that look easy and usually aren't. There are all sorts of things we have to chew through. And so this preach is to, to give you something of a vision. We're going to have some Q&A time afterwards down in the hub, kind of between youth and student lunch. Um, and there's some more resources in small group notes. But I want you to think about it. I want us to think about it today. And to think about a Christian vision of creation and our place in it how we should respond to the climate crisis. And as I thought about this, I thought, oh, it's really complicated. It's really hard. There's all these things. And yeah, like, so plastic's bad. We all know plastic's bad, except when it's good. Yeah, except when we want food to not go off as quickly, and so it's transported in plastic, and that reduces food waste. Apart from when we build things out of plastic rather than metal, which makes them lighter, which reduces transport emissions as they're moved around the world. Apart from when we need some personal protective equipment to help protect us against a really deadly, uh, virulent virus, then plastic's good, but it's bad. Human activity has only started to impact the, the global climate in the past 60 to 100 years. Or so, during that same period, millions of people have been brought out of poverty. Infant mortality rates have halved, and most people are living for longer and in far greater material comfort than they ever did before, and those two things are related. So it's complicated. But it's also very basic for Christians. I'm just going to tell the story of the Bible and then look at some very standard Christian behaviours. And in these, we will find all the perspective and motivation and power we need to respond to the climate crisis in a way that pleases God. It may involve a lot of change for you, but it's not a change of thinking. It's not a change of where we get our information from or how we look to respond to God and his word. So God, we pray that you would give us grace, that we would carry a sense of wonder at you and your creation, and we'd apply it to our own lives, and you'd help me to do this, please. Amen. The story starts before creation with the creator, eternally existing in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And from this fullness, all life comes. He made it, all of it. And it shows us some of the things of what he is like. It doesn't show us everything about God, but it shows us a lot about him. The Psalms, like the one we've read, there are loads of them that just talk about how God's creation speaks to us of him. Romans 1 makes this connection explicit. It says what can be known about God is plain because God has shown it. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So what do we learn about him from the things that have been made? We learn that he is the giver of life. He's where it all comes from. We learn that he loves abundance and variety and diversity because we see it everywhere. We see his relatedness, Father, Son, and Spirit. They then create a, a, an entire uh, you know, physical matter. Our world is related. It all connects to one another, all the parts of it, because that's what God's like. He is profoundly committed to what he has made. He sustains it at all times. What he does, no one else can do. When he made everything, he declared it good. Job 38, 7 adds that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy as he did it. The physical world is not inferior to the spiritual world. 
There's been a long history of that way of thinking in the church, but it's not in the Bible. We just read Psalm 104 says, may the Lord rejoice in his works. Not may the Lord think, oh, that's all right, but I've actually got something much better. And it's not just that God likes it. It's that he made it for his beloved son as a gift. Colossians 1 says, all things were created for him. And so how it is treated matters to him. It is full of riches. It is incredible. It is not limitless. Only God is without limits. But it is designed so that life can flourish. It is not autonomous. Only God can exist in and of himself without reference to anything else. All of creation depends on him and also on those whom he has called to care for it. And that's everyone. Because all men and women are made in the image of God to be his representatives on earth. We're part of creation. We're made from the dust. We we aren't kind of jetted in. We're made from the dust. We're made on the same day, Genesis says, as all the other beasts of the earth. And yet we're above the rest of it as well. We have unique capabilities and responsibilities. We are commanded to care for and cultivate what God has made, to work it for good. Timothy Keller says, We share in doing the things that God has done in creation, bringing order out of chaos, creatively building a civilization out of the material of physical and human nature, caring for all that God has made. So in in Psalm 104, did you notice that people do things with what God gives them? We work. Certain animals become livestock, which means we use them in all sorts of ways. Plants are cultivated. They are developed to improve their fruitfulness and their helpfulness. Grapes are made into wine. Olives are made into oil. Wheat is made into bread. We sail the seas on ships we have made to find food and to trade and to have adventures. But we do other things too. And this is where the note of disharmony, the only note of disharmony in Psalm 104, comes near the end, when sinners and the wicked are mentioned. And that's us. When we turned away from God to go our own way, sin entered the world. Personified by the enemy who exists only to steal and destroy, sin pollutes everything. It ruins our relationship with God, our relationships with each other, and our relationship with the rest of creation. Genesis 3 says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Romans 8 says, The creation was subjected to futility. It is in bondage to corruption. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This happens directly through the wrong things we do, when we, you know, we just wantonly destroy things and we waste things. But it also happens indirectly. There is chaos and carnage, carnage just unleashed in the world now because sin is here. Hosea 4 says, There's no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. There is a cosmic dimension, there is a creation wide dimension to what we have done. We are literally desecrators. Often God's judgment for doing this takes the form of decreation, a return to chaos. It also includes being left to our own devices, reaping what we've sown. So this is the complexity of climate change. We live in this wonderful world that is infected with sin. We have unique and incredible potential, which is sometimes used for good, sometimes used for wrong, and usually used for a kind of sum of both. And that's why paradoxes exist like economic success causing environmental disaster. It's why simple solutions don't exist. But this shouldn't make us fatalistic because it's not the end of the story. 
So God's restoration begins with the people of Israel. As we've seen, their songs are full of praise to God as creator. Their laws cared for the poor and the vulnerable and animals and the land. This included a Sabbath rest for all creation on one day every week. It included a jubilee of restoration every 50 years. There's loads more to explore about that, but we're going to move on to Jesus. Because when Jesus comes to earth, he isn't just blessing the material world with his presence, he is becoming part of it. He is simultaneously out with it because he's the eternal creator God. But he is now in it too, and he takes on flesh. He takes on matter, and he has not taken it off. When he dies on the cross... He is saving us from our sins, but he is doing more than that. Colossians 1 says that he was reconciling all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He is winning his bride. He is claiming his inheritance. The fall is being undone. The defeat of sin and death has begun. Everything will be brought back under God's perfect rule. That means all of creation. Romans 8, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When the Bible uses language to describe what this is like, it uses animals, vegetables, or fruit certainly, and minerals to do so. It's a physical event. Jesus is resurrected to a new physical body. And we are promised that if we believe in him, we will receive one of those too. And we will live in those bodies in a physical place. What God declared good at the beginning will not be scrapped. The earth will be cleansed, renewed, and reunited with heaven forever. There will be places to go, things to do, food to eat and there will be no hint of sin's effects except for the scars on our saviour who will be with us sharing our excitement in it all and receiving our praise for having made it all and rescued it all for having made us and rescued us God's plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ things in heaven and things on earth will have been achieved That is the story. And it shows us that creation and caring for it are central aspects. I didn't have to go to some obscure verses here and there. I've just told you the story. These aren't fringe issues. They are right in the middle of God's purposes. And Christians have a complete view of the situation. Thanks to God's revelation of himself as the creator, the owner, the sustainer, of his revelation of who we are, that we are called to care for and cultivate creation, of our understanding of sin as the corrupting and complicating factor in each of us and everywhere on earth, and of the ultimate hope of healing and restitution, which has begun in Christ's resurrection and which we are now meant to participate in in every way possible. So what should we do? Well... There are loads of practical applications. There are loads of decisions to be made. I'd love for you to talk about those in small groups this week, which is why your notes are full of things that will help with that. But again, what I want to do today is just show you, this is just, again, very normal Christian behavior. Even if it leads to radical decisions, it's normal Christian behavior because it's this, love God and love your neighbors. That's, that's what it requires. Jesus said those are the greatest commandments. If you want to boil down what living for Jesus looks like, it's that. We love God as we praise him, as we've praised him today, as we praise him like the Psalms tell us to, because of all that he has made. That we are given free reign to be inspired by creation to worship God. Maybe you've got just a small like, patch of garden or, or, or you're able to look out when it's not cloudy and, and see the stars in the sky. And obviously we've now got like half the day is night, so that's easier now. We live 
in a city that is full of and surrounded by incredible, beautiful, awe-inspiring nature. But the awe that we're meant to feel isn't just like, wow, what a mountain. Oh, the sea, incredible. No, what a mind to have conceived of that. What power to have made it and to be sustaining it right now. It's to cause us to praise God for who he is. So I want to encourage you, even if you have to wear a lot of clothes to do it, to get out there and sing psalms of praise to God. But you can't really love someone and trash their stuff, can you? Caring for creation is honouring and loving the God who made it and cares for it and is sustaining it. You don't want to be working against him, do you? Now, that doesn't mean that we, you know, we're not to use anything because we've seen that cultivation is part of our calling. But it means treating everything we have as what it is, which is his. So we ask questions, are we using this well? Are we using it fruitfully? Are we using it for good? Are we using it worshipfully? Loving our neighbours follows this because they're part of God's possession too. Jesus refused to allow us to limit our definition of who our neighbour is. We may feel geographically detached from places where pollution is really obviously happening, where climate change effects are already being seen. You might think, I wouldn't mind if Scotland got a bit warmer and there's lots of water clearly, so maybe we'll be okay. That's just not how we're to think. Directly and indirectly, we are to love our neighbours, and Jesus makes it very clear that's everyone. So we can work to improve the world for other people by the things we do, the things we don't do, the things we reduce doing. God has given us incredible creativity. And we can use this in all sorts of ways to love our neighbours in this way. Given the scale of the challenges of climate change, I mean, if you read anything about it, you're like, this is so big, this is so hard, it's really tempting to look at our own situation and feel irrelevant, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm looking at my, I don't know, some carton or I'm like, I'm going to recycle this. And what on earth difference is that going to make when coal-fired power stations are still being built all over the world? We feel that, don't we? Well, listen, we don't dodge taxes just because big companies do. Christians believe that every one of us will one day stand before God to give an account for our actions. That will include what we did with what God gave us, how we loved him and our neighbours through creation. So Deb and I tried to make choices in light of this. Five years ago, we mostly stopped cooking with meat. We um, reflected, Lisa actually said, what do you think about this? And I reflected on how animals are treated in a lot of the food industry, not all of it, but a lot of it, certainly a lot of where we were getting our our meat from, and we thought, well, maybe we need to stop doing that then. And so we did, and we love meat. So this wasn't an easy choice, but Deb's really creative, and actually I don't miss our previous diet. I was horrified at the time at the consequences of where my thoughts had taken me, And we do eat meat sometimes because we want to support producers who do this well. We don't want to impose this decision on other people. And Jesus wasn't a vegetarian. But actually, when you eat it less and you eat it when it comes from a good place, it is a feast to savour. I've learned to get better at fixing things, which is not in my natural makeup. I've learned at least to get, I've learned to be good at keeping them for longer than I might otherwise have done so. Now, I can't say hand on heart that we holiday mostly in the UK because of purely wanting to reduce reduce flight pollution. We've got two small kids, and they don't want to be sitting still in a confined space for any length of time. And um, there have obviously been travel restrictions. But actually, that is a factor in our decisions. And we've got kids, and kids require a lot of stuff. But we love finding networks of kind of hand-me-downs. There are some within church, and there's others that we've connected to elsewhere as well, and free cycling and second-hand shopping and things like this. Is, it's there. Convenience and price are powerful motivators, aren't they? But we've tried to make decisions that make justice and sustainability equally significant factors in as many of our decisions 
as we can. And there's loads of stuff online that's helped us with this. But what really helps is asking God to change our hearts, to help us renounce greed and to grow in self-control. Put it really barely, that will, kind of, that will do it. The Bible says that greed is idolatry. Tim Keller again, an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. That is basically how marketing works. It wants us to feel that way about a product, about a service, and we like feeling that way, so we go along with it. But it doesn't work. But then we see another message that promises it will work, and we'll go for that again. And we go again and again, and we keep consuming, but are never satisfied. We keep eating, but we're never full. Because God alone can do that. Only God can give you the identity you really need. Only God can satisfy you in your heart. Only God can give your life meaning. We now see the, the same thing applied, it's really interesting, same thing applied to the climate crisis. So I now see adverts saying, save the planet by buying this new and better thing. It will make you feel better for having done so. I'm like, do you know, I think, I think it would be more realistic to say, buy less stuff and fix things and share more. I'm again going to put my caveat at the start of economic growth and uh, ecological destruction, just mentioning it and then we'll move on. But Christians are able to do this because they aren't putting their hope and their identity in this life and the things we can get here. Jesus told us very plainly, it won't work. We might struggle to agree with that. We might struggle to believe it. Hey, Christmas is coming. It, it, we, you know, we just live in a world designed to think, so what would you like? And what would you like people to get you? And what are you going to give, get everyone else? But actually, this is a year-round issue now, isn't it? And so we need to grow in self-control. And self-control, for most people, is just them trying their best. But for Christians... It is the fruit of God's Holy Spirit's work in your life that grows when you start to work with him on it. Self-control, led by the Holy Spirit, enables us to deny ourselves things that we want but don't need. It actually leads to a redefinition of what need is. It enables us to make sacrifices so that others are blessed and so that others flourish. It isn't automatic it has to be learned. But any discussion about personal responses to climate change talks about the significant change that people are going to have to make. It says people are going to have to make changes to their lifestyle. And, you know, wouldn't it just be great if that's the case? Wouldn't it be great to have the creator God Almighty working in you to help you with that? Wouldn't that be the best chance of it happening? Not to be kind of guilted out, not to be just trying our best for as long as we can, but for, to be people-led by the God who cares for all of this. I've learned that as I ask God to help me with this, he does. He gives me other people who I'm able to learn from, who help and encourage me, who I connect with. As I learn to make consciously different choices, over time, those choices become unconscious. They become normal life, and he's moved me. And that's true for all the ways in which God calls us to change. But it's true about this. People observe that most change happens through lots of people making lots of small steps. We see this as governments and businesses react to trends far more frequently than they set unpopular but good agendas. Very rare is a company that says, you're not going to like it, but we've done it. Or well, the government says, no one will vote for it. It's our main policy. They don't do that. But I remember when you could, the only place you could buy anything made fairly, as in fair trade in particular, was in church halls. If you have a certain age, you, know, you remember that. There'd be a church hall, there'd be a stall, and it was called Fair Trade, and you didn't see it anywhere else. By the year 2000, Fair Trade retail sales in the UK were worth 32 million. In 2016, they were worth 1.6 billion. And that is why shops talk about it, because people bought them. And you're like, didn't you just tell me to stop buying stuff? I didn't say stop buying, I said buy carefully, buy better 
Similarly, if we speak with MPs and MSPs about this, even if, they're, you know, even if they're committed to climate change, it will encourage them that this matters to people. It will also help us be heard when we talk about things they disagree with us on. Because then they will see that actually, we're not simply saying you're wrong, you're wrong. Saying, no, we're with you on this, but this, you've, you've not got it right. It's really helpful to work with allies in that way if we can. But there's more to this than sociology. God wants to work with us on this. And he loves using the weak things to shame the strong. And so our personal decisions, even small ones, have significant consequences for us and the world. I said it, I don't know how many times during this message. It's a massive issue. It's really complicated. And most of us, therefore, live between two extremes of daily fear and complete indifference. And I guess many of us live in this kind of middle zone, which is a bit guilty, a bit helpless. And what I wanted you to see today is that creation and caring for it matters to God. And I want you to know that he's involved in it. And he wants to work with you in it. Because he's called you and will give you grace to be a steward of his property. There's loads of links to Christian perspectives on this and practical actions that we can take in the notes of small groups. And like I said, I'm going to do a QA and a in a few minutes down in the hub. But I thought it would be good just to sing finally because we have just about got time if Emma and the band are on stage like now. <laughs> Why don't we pray and then sing and then our service will end. Lord God, we praise you for creation. We praise you for all that you've done. How amazing are your works and it's all yours and we love you and we glorify you for it lord we repent for when we're wasteful when we're selfish for the things we directly do that mess us up and the things that we indirectly do we thank you jesus that you are making all things new and we want to be part of it and we ask that you'd lead us by your holy spirit wherever it takes us whatever the cost help us to understand this rightly do good on the earth for all of our days. Amen.